This chapter is intended for a target audience of adults. This chapter deals with heavy topics that may not be suitable for all audiences. For the sake of my channel, I've tried to make sure everything in here is PG-13 on all scales, so no gratuitous violence, sex, cursing, etc. But if you are a younger viewer, please keep this in mind. Trigger warnings. Toxic slash abusive relationships, blood, religious content, death, suicide ideation, mental illness, and hallucination. So some context before we get into this chapter. You'll need most of this context right at the beginning of the chapter in the beach scene. You're going to need to know that Lonan is Eliza's ex's son, so Lonan's father and Eliza were once in a relationship, and his father is now dead. There's a line when Lonan says he's in the dark room in the beach scene as well. Lonan's father has a dark room at a cabin where a majority of moth work takes place. He and Harrison, his ex, set out to destroy it in chapter one of moth work but never followed through on it. His father's work still exists there, which is a major point of tension in Lonan's inner narrative. This is information that you would have learned in moth work that you wouldn't know in feeding habits, so hopefully the chapter will make sense. But as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will clarify. Previously on Feeding Habits, Chapter 1 Recap We meet Lonan, a reclusive man who has lived a secluded life in the company of his hawkish girlfriend Eliza, working minimal, dull shifts at a hardware store. He and Eliza pick out a wall color for their kitchen, red, and Lonan gets a phone call from his ex-girlfriend Glenn while taping off baseboards. We learn this is a weekly occurrence, except this time, Glenn's living situation seems to have teamed into dangerous. Lonan gets in a car and sets out to find her when Eliza calls him, insisting she is injured when in fact she's covered herself in red paint. What was unaired in that chapter was that after that scene, Lonan gets another call from Glenn later that night, revealing her location, and Eliza warns Lonan not to go after her. Chapter 2 Recap Eliza unknowingly sets Lonan up to paint the kitchen of one of their neighbors, a woman Lonan doesn't know named Anya. Lonan watches Anya's young son Joey when she runs out for errands, and to his dismay, concludes children are the wicked stems of adults. When Anya arrives home, Lonan realizes her husband, who she suggested is still alive, is very much dead and Anya struggling in her grief. Lonan is invited to dinner by Anya and returns to his apartment where he hobbies holding his breath underwater and is confronted by Eliza when he lets her know of his evening plans. In a dissociative state, Lonan walks to a church instead of Anya's apartment, gives a false confession to the priest, and publicly collapses shortly after exiting the building. Feeding Habits Chapter 3. Witness State The water is never murky, but today it doesn't sparkle. Like it's taken a low dose of cyan, it foams pale against the shore, an offering that wets the tips of Lonan's shoes. He sits under the cove with one hand pressed into the current, each singular wave like a finger culling his veins. Today their beautiful place is only an arched wall of stones and roily ocean. Eliza is sunbathing. She lies on her back in the center of the cove, where its mouth opens to a ceiling of sun. On the drive from the hospital, they both remain silent, Eliza's hands taut like leather around the steering wheel and Lonan's head soldered to the cool window. Even when she pulled into the lot of a diner named after a vague Canadian city or perennial flower, she said nothing, exiting the car to return to it with two crayon-colored slushies, his red, hers orange. By the time she pulled up to the beach, her drink was half empty, his fully melted, urging against the brim of the cup. He followed her when she exited the car, parked against a row of pebbles, placed his hand palm first against the water the moment she lay on the sand and closed her eyes. Now, water puckers the shoreline between his fingers, a sort of absent massage. The water's dull, vitamin-like blue, warmer than he's expected for the middle of February pleasantly pruning his fingertips. The sun has started to set. It flares against the horizon, its orange singeing the water's blue. Like in front of the church, it fills him, its heat a comfortable grip around his throat. Though it should remind him to keep awake, its warmth lulls him closer to the sand until he rests his head just where the water laps. He knows it says nothing. He knows he has not slept in days. 
But to him, its rays nurse his skin like the loop of a nursery rhyme, and when he is parallel to the sky, he closes his eyes and welcomes the sun like it's an infection. As colors pulse underneath his eyelids, water soaks the crown of his head, and it truly is like being buried at sea, just him, the sun, and the water at his perimeter. They said you were at confession. This is the first thing Eliza says. He could ask her for a burial. It would be unconventional to set a living man out to drift, but he could ask her. It would be easier than thinking about Joey, about Anya's dead husband, about other dead men, about the man he said he was to the priest, about all the things that managed to lead back to his father. Like an ugly configuration of pipelines or the rills of water from puddles, from streams, from minor sinkholes in the road, that all somehow lead back to this singular body of water. What did you confess? Maybe Lonan is the wicked one. Maybe Joey will always be innocent. Maybe he will never let go of his rice maraca and Anya will always be a perfect mother. Maybe he's dreamt it all. Maybe there is no Joey, no Anya, no church, no car tricks, no hospital, no drugs, no Eliza. He's lying on sand. He could have walked here. He could have found enough loose change between the futon's frame to pay for his red crayon slushy by himself. He needs no one else's money. Maybe Glenn never called him. Maybe Glenn and that rice maraca don't exist. Maybe there is no need to ask Eliza for a burial at sea. Maybe this already is one. When he opens his eyes, the sky is blood red and his father kneels above him, trickling seawater onto his forehead with the bitten end of Eliza's slushy straw. He wears a navy blue suit, four pink carnations pinned neatly in his breast pocket, the smell of his cologne just like the one Lonan wears, a sort of astringent rosewood. The last quarter of sun steadily disappears underneath the water's break and forms a halo behind his father's head so his light hair dissolves. And as his father flutes water onto his forehead so it disperses at his eyes, he smiles so Lonan sees his mouth is not a man's, but a wolf's grin that splinters with sunlight when he howls. Accept what comes to you each day, Lonan mutters, nonsensical, studies each rung of his father's rib throat as his toothed mouth gets closer. The raw pink of his tongue, the ivory spike of canines. That's all you need to do. Lonan raises a hand in front of his face, and his fingers tremble with light. His father is voiceless, but insists forward, and when the tip of his tooth nears his throat, Lonan closes his eyes so the sun bleeds its colors again, and he can't tell if the heat comes from the sun rays or his father's bite. That's what she told the priest? That wasn't serious, Lonan. I was reading off a fortune cookie. When Lonan opens his eyes for the second time, his father is not a man with a wolf's mouth. He does not wear pink carnations in his suit's breast pocket or smell like rosewood. He is not there. No outline, no shadow. The sky is not red. At best, it is a muted tangerine. Eliza's bitten straw sits in the remains of her watery orange slushy, and she lies where she was previous, her chin still lifted to the sun. Lonan becomes aware of his body, how the water pushes gently at his scalp, how damp sand grits at the back of his neck, the spot of cotton and tape tugging against his right arm. His chest rickets like an accordion. Without looking, he scoops up a palm full of sand and rubs his thumb along it until his prints blister. You brought my sister here, Lonan says, his voice sticking and nearly non-existent. He lifts a hand to his throat but feels no bite mark, no trace of a tooth lodged in the skin, no blood. Was that your confession? Eliza laughs. That means my father was here once. I never brought your father to the cove. I meant Las Vegas. My father visited you. He hears Eliza shift upward but doesn't look. He keeps his eyes focused on the fading sun, the way it skitters across the water's membrane. Is this my confession now? She asks, her voice wax-like suffocating. You told me he visited you the first time you brought me here. 
How long have you had the apartment? Why are you asking? He's following me, Lonan whispers. He only follows me places he's been. Are you saying you're haunted? Lonan turns over so Liza materializes. He doesn't have to search her face for the answer because he already knows. She looks at him with a sort of dejected fondness, her arms crossed now, setting up so the sun frills her head. When she reaches for the rest of her now-melted slushy, he speaks again, his voice just the thread of a question. Did you make him a key too, or is the one I'm using his? You're outrageous, Eliza says. Then why can't you answer my question? Eliza stands. She dusts sand off her dress and grabs her high heels with her pinky. She walks toward the car without him, her bare feet kicking up clouds of sand. Lonan watches her, the way the wind picks up her hair and has it reach toward him. I had nothing to confess, Lonan says, lifts himself onto his elbow. I was walking to Anya's apartment and ended up at the church. I lied to him. I lied to the priest. I told him I was married with children and played checkers with my father every weekend. She doesn't turn around. He squeezes the water from his hair and wrings his hands out the same moment he rises. He stumbles in the sand, follows her shrinking body. I think children are wicked, he says, stepping over rings of a gelatinous sea kelp, driftwood. I feel a responsibility to take care of a child that isn't mine. Eliza's pace quickens and she navigates the rocky shore with ease. I feel guilty for every child that grows up without a father. I could have told the priest all of those things, but I told him my father and I paint birdhouses and my wife is an expert seamstress. When Eliza reaches the lot, nearly kicking over four of the pebbles that mark out their parking spot, Lonan stops in the sand and puts a hand over his mouth, tasting the salt of the sea, the crunch of sand between his teeth. His breaths catch. He does not remember the difference between an inhale and an exhale. I want to see my father again, Lonan says, louder than he's meant to. The small family peers back from their picnic across the stretch. A dog walker with two Pomeranians takes an alternate route along the tree line. Eliza taps sand out of her heels and unlocks the car. When she finally looks at him, there's a dullness in her eyes and her red lipstick has smudged to her cheek. Your father is dead, Lonan. Not yet. What do you want me to do? Buy a sage and sprinkle salt in front of our doorway to ward off his spirit? He is dead. No, he isn't. Explain how your father is still alive when we both know he's not. He's in the dark room. Lonan approaches her slowly, still fumbling through the sand like a young deer. He kicks one of the pebbles when he reaches the asphalt and puts both of his hands palm down on the back windshield of the car not to steady himself, but to feel the jolt of hot sun baked into the glass. His vision warbles. He cannot tell if the sky is above him or if he is waist high at its surface. Eliza pulls her pumps close to her chest and smooths her hair as if this will beautify their public display. A silver SUV of teenage girls pulls up a few feet away, and when one shouts quickly at Eliza a sort of embarrassed offer if any help is needed, she sets her pumps down and puts both hands on Lonan's face until his jaw trembles. You aren't thinking right, she says. Her palms are cold even though she's just spent an hour sitting in the sun. You're seeing things. I need to find him. Eliza pulls their bodies together until he's cradled against her chest. Today, she smells like rain and orange slushy. Lonan's hair soaks into her shirt front turning the mauve silk brass. He knows the fabric will never dry the same, even though the water will never damage it. He knows he is a haunted man. He knows he cannot hide from his father. He knows the places he'll find his dad in the apartment if he really looks, and knows with certainty that wicked children exist. But in Eliza's arms, huddled awkwardly, seawater dripping down her blouse and onto the asphalt, he knows he should know nothing but Eliza. She comes through his hair, hushing him like a toddler. And when she speaks, her breath riles each cell of his skin until they surrender. I'm going to fix you, 
She kisses the space behind his ear, and when she speaks next, her voice rattles. And then you will be perfect. There is a moth at the window. Lonan's good at identifying them now. Their brown bellies, the paper-like shuffle of their wings. This one is a gypsy moth, marbled with gray. He's seen many of them the last few nights, heard their faint buzz, the instant flitter of their wings just outside the screen of the bedroom window. Lonan still smells like rubbing alcohol from where a nurse swabbed at his arm before drawing a blood test. Getting him to the hospital was easy. When the woman whose name he learned was Juna asked what she should do, worried about an overdose or a mental breakdown, he pointed to her phone three times as if dialing 911. Juna drove him to the nearest hospital a few blocks away and together they entered, Juna, her daughters, and Lonan, into the bleach stink of the emergency room. In a hush, she explained the situation to the nurse at the front desk, and he imagined the words she told her, how a strange man, straight from confession, nearly collapsed, wardless, onto the steps of a cathedral. How he opened his mouth for the sun like it would choke him right on the concrete. Shortly after, he was led to four different rooms where four different people prodded at him. Sean's straws of light into his eyes, pressed a stethoscope to his chest so cold it felt like a burn, felt the waxy seal of the blood pressure cuff closed around his upper arm, had a needle pricked into the soft flesh of his forearm, watched two nurses glance at each other and mouth no drugs. It wasn't long after that that he heard her, the pen-like click of her heels rushing against linoleum, the twist of a red bullet of lipstick he watched her pull out and the reflection of the hand dryer he stared into. Eliza spoke quickly to everyone, the nurses, Juna, the children, in words he didn't understand, a matter of tongues. She'd changed into a pantsuit and wore a brooch on her jacket front she'd insisted was an heirloom, a tomato-like gem pricked with quartz around the edges. His arm throbbed into the cotton ball the nurse had taped against his skin, and he pulled on it and the needle's exit wound to feel its jolt the longer she spoke. Juna was the one to notice this tick first, her eyes widening at the sight of the sheared pinkish cotton ball, like someone had pulsed lightning into her spine. Eliza saw him fifteen minutes after this, when the nurse rushed in to pull his hands away from his arm and closed the door. No one knew his name, not the nurses, not Juna, not her children, and no one would, because Eliza took him gently around the shoulders the next time the door opened and led him outside, past the gummy walls of the emergency room, past Juna and her kids who watched wondrously, and back to the car where Lonan curled into the window until they arrived at the beach. Eliza now sleeps in their bed. Uncovered patches of her skin glow from the duvet, her hair curtaining the rest. Unconscious, she's lamb-like, her sharpest edges softening. As he stands by the window, finger pressed into the barrier of glass, he takes turns watching her and the moth. Her forehead gleams like the eyeball of an arachnid. He opens the window. Slow so its frame barely creaks, the outside air an assault he doesn't mind. Las Vegas smells like lavender and car exhausts, a tart crudeness he will never get used to. Lonan pushes aside the filter he unscrewed when the moths first started appearing, and through it the moth flies, plants itself on the corner of the chest of drawers. He is not an expert on moths or what signifies their identity, but tonight he knows this is not the first time this one has visited. As the moth flitters atop the dresser, Lonan shifts toward the nightstand. He reaches for the tissue containing the pearl-like pills he spit out and picks one up with the tips of his fingers. It's gummy and lopsided from saliva, but still whole enough. He studies it in a beak of moonlight, the manufacturer's impression licked clean from the surface. It is no one's choice for him to take the pills, just an inevitability, like a sheep being sheared of its fur, like a calf being slaughtered, an unhelpable, definite thing. He sets the pills back onto the tissue and rubs their powdery residue onto the edge of his shirt. The floorboards don't creak as he moves across the room and out to the hallway. He's gotten good at walking around undetected. The kitchen is quiet when he enters. It's not that he's expecting any different. The kitchen is always quiet, but tonight it seems even quieter. Moonbeams strain through the screen door and color everything blue. 
Blue refrigerator, blue hardwood, blue dishwasher, blue sheen of the futon's empty seat cushions. When he squints, the gypsy moth from the bedroom materializes, unfurling its wings, bobbing like a fisherman's bait. Lonan rubs his eyes and jars open the glassware cabinet with his knuckle. He retrieves a cup and fits it under the neck of the faucet, filling the glass to its brim on the coldest setting. Eliza keeps the acetaminophen hidden inside a salt shaker, so when the glass is filled, he retrieves it, unscrewing the apple-shaped shaker and retrieving a single white tablet. It is when he puts the pill on his tongue, swishes a gulp of water, and turns toward the television to drink it that he notices his father sitting unperturbed on the couch. He sputters at the sight, water splashing up his chin through his nostrils. Moonlight makes his father's hair blue just like the leather of the futon he sits on. Lonan blinks once, twice, contains a wheeze in his fist, but the image does not change. Though it should be fear Lonan feels at the sight of his father, his presence thrills him to know he's been right, that his father has spent time in this apartment, that Eliza is a liar, or at the very least, a skilled withholder. His father sits, undisturbed, one foot propped onto the underbelly of the coffee table's lattice. And when he turns, the transparent frames of his glasses catching in an orange street light from below, he looks at his son and places a finger to his lips. Be quiet. Lonan knows he is being summoned, although he trembles when he sets his water glass back onto the counter, although his father says nothing, just a wordless cutout of a man, he knows to walk to the futon, his steps slow and deliberate as the floor beneath him gelatinizes. His father holds a photo album. Lonan doesn't recognize this one from the apartment. Heavy black, plastic frame, a glass-encased photo of the Mona Lisa, its cover image. He's never thought of Eliza as the photograph type, and the albums she does own are actually repurposed presentation folders and contain a few pictures. One an infant, he recalls, the next a sepia portrait of a woman he's always assumed to be her mother. The Lonan stays behind the futon at all times. This doesn't stop him from peering at the photos his father pages through, all copies of the same picture. He's seen this one before. He's held it, carried it, hoarded it, developed wrong, orange splotches obscuring her face, though he'll never mistake it now. Eliza on a busy European street, the sun glazing her hair, the same style she wears now, the flutter of tourism and its colors behind her, reds, yellows, jades. His father thumbs each edge of the photo and then Eliza herself, his fingers smudging against the plastic covering of the duplicates. It should be confusing or at least intriguing that his girlfriend once existed as an iteration who'd send his father a postcard while traveling. This relationship should be, at the very least, confusing or intriguing. He should wonder the places Eliza and his father once went, whether that's the beautiful place or this apartment. He should wonder what their hobbies were, trying new age remedies like Eliza's energy shots or painting kitchen walls the color of a carcass. He should wonder which streets they've walked, whether his father preferred confession at the church uptown or downtown, whether he knew the neighbors Lonan vaguely recognizes like Anya and he could tell anyone their middle names and birthstones. He should wonder what else Eliza has hidden and the things he will never find, why he hasn't slept in three days and why he will avoid it as long as he sleeps next to Eliza. These are his unknown variables. These are questions he wants answered. His father taps on the photograph, circling Eliza's face once, twice, three times. When they exchange a glance, Lonan cannot differentiate their faces. He gets lost, tumbling through his inherited blue eyes and doesn't entangle himself. It's this circling like a validation, like an acknowledgement of a problem that his father repeats, insistent, until Lonan looks once more at their bedroom. Eliza still sleeps, soundless, the comforter disbanding and rebanding around her as she breathes. It is when he looks at her that he feels certain his unhaunting will only occur without her. Just letting you guys know, I cut out the rest of this scene just because I didn't think it would be appropriate to put in this chapter. I know where this chapter ends off sounds very murdery. <laughs> I apologize. It it doesn't doesn't go that direction 
All you need to know is that Lonan is having a bit of a mental breakdown and Eliza is seeing that. And that's all you need to know for the next chapter. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I had a lot of fun narrating it. This one is really weird. I remember this chapter gave me a lot of trouble when I was writing it. And I think I like this final iteration. So you guys let me know what you think because... It took me a really long time to write and revise. It was really tricky. Look out for chapter four. Let me know when you guys want it. And thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>